Kramer. Uh, my name is Professor Khalil Habib. I'm an assistant professor of philosophy in the uh, depart philosophy department here at Salve and the director of the honors program. And it just turns out that by coincidence, Professor Kramer has just been named the director of his honors program at Kennesaw State University. <laughs> professor Kramer is an assistant professor of political science at Kennesaw State. He is the associate. Associate. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. Oh, I wasn't promoting you. Demoted. Yeah. <laughs> I was not taking your rank. <laughs> Check your email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, you may be in for something. Professor Kramer is the, uh, the author of a number of books on Plato and Xenophon, and he is absolutely no stranger to any of you. I know you all know him, but for the purposes of the video, I'm going to introduce him. I believe this is the fifth time Professor Kramer has been here. Uh, he's lectured previously on Thucydides, on uh, Edmund Burke, on uh, Homer's Odyssey, and he's going to spend the, the weekend, a few days, taking us through Sophocles, Euripides, and Shakespeare. So uh, that's it for my introduction. So, Professor Kramer, welcome to South. Right. Thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah, I see many familiar faces. It's always good to be back here. And uh, for those told me, that, well, we were reading three books, um, three plays: uh, Sophocles and Antigone, uh, Euripides and Medea, and Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. And uh, those told me that these are part of your core general education program. And uh, these are wonderful books for, for any core and uh, important books for general education, not in the sense of just being familiar with things, but in the sense that these three plays really touch on the most important questions human beings can raise and think about, and therefore they're important just for human beings as being part of humanity. So they're, uh, they, they will, they will uh, illuminate and they'll throw light on each other. Each play really discusses questions about uh, human nature and his relation to the gods and religion and to, to politics. Uh, and we'll see that uh, the three authors really uh, disagree with each other in, in many ways, and you can create a conversation uh, amongst them. Uh, and they're, of course, the, the, the form of them, they're, they're, it's poetry, and uh, we're reading two tragedies and a comedy. Um, the tragedies are classical, uh, but there are great differences between them. Sophocles and Euripides don't agree about the nature of tragedy. And we'll have to think about Euripides' reform of Sophocles. Aristotle says that of the two, Euripides is more tragic. Uh, the two authors will have to think about what Aristotle means by that. And why there's such a great debate about what tragedy is. Uh, and I do want to talk a little bit about that because uh, I think that tragedy and comedy uh, are very foreign to us as, as America is living in the modern world. Uh, tragedy just isn't crying, it's just not suffering, and comedy just isn't yucks and laughing. I mean, so we, we have those things. We have uh, entertainments that uh, involve crying, pitying, and, and death, and we have obviously entertainments that are, are comical and full of laughter. Uh, but for the Greeks, uh, you know, tragedy is really a form of education. It's not just an entertainment. Um, the writers of the tragedies were almost like divine beings, speaking to the gods, teaching the Greeks about the nature of the gods. The tragic experience. Uh, but it's not just you know, some crying and some suffering or some pitying. The tragic experience was meant to teach men uh, about the experience of the world. It was a moral experience. You, know, you would learn about what it, meant, what it means to break a divine law. You would learn what it means to suffer for breaking a divine law and the, and the punishments that it entailed. Uh, it was really, therefore, a way of educating uh, the moral sense, educating uh, the mind about the of laws, uh, tragedy is therefore it's a form of self-knowledge and enlightenment for the Greeks. Um, and in this sense, tragedy is very opposed to the way we think and the way we feel as Americans living in, in a democracy. Uh, and I just wanted to you know, make some corrections uh, about the way we think of tragedy, because for us, everything's a tragedy. You know, someone cuts themselves or falls down, it's a tragedy. I mean, we, we have used the term so much, so I think there's a, a, a need for, for some correction before we actually jump into, into the play. So we get a, a, a clear sense of just how foreign uh, Sophoclean tragedy is from us, uh, how much effort is really needed to try to re-experience the world of Sophocles. It's not democratic. Tragedy is the witness of, of greatness, suffering greatness. You have to have an idea of what it means to be great, what it means for a great man to fall. So the tragedy is really about the kings, about the heroes. Um, 
men that the gods are concerned with, uh, there's no such thing as every man having his own tragedy. Uh, now that said, of course, that there can be different experiences of tragedy. There's a female tragedy we're going to be reading, it's Antigone. Uh, there's a tragedy of an old man, Oedipus of Colonus, that's a story of Oedipus and old. Uh, and then, of course, Oedipus the Tyrant is about him at, at a mature age. So, I mean, different people can have their tragedies, but they have to be great. And the Greeks, when they wrote these tragedies, they thought they were witnessing their own ancestors. This is a story of the house of, of Labicus. Uh, and you know, you, you, you know studying your, your own history, something that belonged to your, your people. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this, this would help to inform you about what you are by seeing the sufferings of your ancestors. So it was by no means something distant from them, but it was something uh, very, very real to them. Uh, another reason we have problems with tragedy, not only are we you know, very democratic and we'd like to think of everything as equal, uh, another problem is that we're very rational. And for Sophocles especially, tragedy is about um, man's terrible fate you know, and the, the, the terrible sufferings. Um, and there's nothing you can do to prevent these things from happening. As, as Americans living in you know, modern you know, scientific world, though, we're very preventative. We always think there are preventative measures that you can take. We like to look at everything rationally. Uh, if, if you're sick, well, you can always figure out some medicine, you know. And uh, if you die, the only tragedy is they hadn't discovered the medicine that could have cured you, you know. And so uh, every tragedy for Americans are you're born too late because something could have been done. Uh, there's always some preventative measure that we can take. Uh, but for the Greeks, that's not the way the world is. You know, um, they're not interested in prevention. Uh, they don't think that the worst of evils can be prevented. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very fated world. Um, and there are certain things that man does not have within his control. And part of wisdom means facing the inevitability of those things. And for them to live in a preventative world where you think that through the arts and sciences you can prevent all bad things happening from you to you, that's an illusion. This is not uh, this is not the way the, the world really is, uh, and uh, you know, I, want, I want to discuss I want to introduce Antigone and uh, this this theme of man's fate. I want to discuss uh, Oedipus the tyrant first. I mean, Oedipus, of course, is Antigone's famous father and brother, both, <laughs> uh, and that's a story about fate. Uh, you know, Oedipus never did anything wrong. It was just from his birth, he was fated to, to kill his father and sleep with his mother. So God had fated this. Uh, and um, his parents, you know, feared, feared the fate and they tried to avoid it. Uh, and he himself had heard of the, uh, his fate as well and tried to avoid it and he couldn't avoid it. You know, and so it's very much a story of inevitability. Uh, it's also a story about human identity and man's relation to the gods. And this is also something very interesting. Uh, we'll get into it in greater detail when we talk about Antigone. But uh, the lesson Oedipus learns is that what, what really did him in was he didn't know where he came from. He didn't know his origins. Uh, his parents had given him up. He was raised by strangers. He killed a man he thought was a stranger. He slept with a woman he thought was a stranger. You know, uh, and you know, he didn't know his origins, uh, where he came from. Uh, and he also thought he was wise. He answered the riddle of the Sphinx. And Sophocles is very interested in the conflict between human wisdom and, and, and man's fate. And the riddle of the Sphinx was, you know, what, what, what walks on first at four, on four legs, then on two legs, then on three legs? And of course the answer is man, yeah. Uh, and uh, Oedipus believed he solved the, the riddle of man understood what man was, and to, the, the, the riddle is, you know, we walk on four and two and three, and that man is born, he matures, and then he dies, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the organism comes in, the human organism comes into being, it, uh, it grows, and then it passes away. And the answer, of course, of the riddle of man is also the answer of his own life, because, you know, he was uh, chained as a baby and walking on all fours, and then eventually he walks on two, and then in Oedipus at Columbus, of course, he walks with a cane, and he's on three. So we actually see him going through the stages uh, of life. Uh, 
And we learned that Oedipus actually couldn't live with his own supposed wisdom. If Manchester to Bina comes into being and passes away, then there's nothing sacred in his life. He has no sacred relations. Then it shouldn't be such a big deal to sleep with your mother and kill your, your father. What's wrong with that? Uh, and what's interesting, too, is to some extent, we live in a scientific world, and we can part believe that. You know, the idea is that your, your body is your own. It shouldn't be regulated by anything outside of your body other than your own will. There are no sacred relations. Um, uh, and especially in relation to birth, if the body is your own, your reproduction, your sexuality are your own, then there shouldn't be any divine laws ruling it, there shouldn't be any communal laws ruling these things. Uh, it just comes to being, and it just, it just is. And in Oedipus, uh, the tyrant, we, we examine that possibility, you know, can he live that way? And so he learns that he, he performed these deeds, you know, and he's terrified of them. You know, uh, he's horrified by it. He believes that he has uh, done some, he's broken some kind of sacred or divine law. And the teaching there, obviously, is that man's body isn't just his own. It's connected to some kind of divine or moral order. That the breaking of these laws should inspire terror within man. That there's punishment. And that human beings can't be, therefore, completely divorced from their origins. That uh, sexuality, procreation, uh, you know, love and the family have some kind of uh, meaning. And uh, as we go through Sophocles, we'll see that he's trying to very much affirm these me the meaningfulness of these of these relations to show you that they're just not nothing. That there needs to be uh, appropriate sentiments, experiences, ways in which we recognize the divine law, um, ways in which man should suffer if he breaks these laws. And in, in this sense, you could say there's a, a moral education taking place in these, in these plays. Um, now Oedipus, not only did he claim to be wise, he's also Oedipus the tyrant. He claimed to solve the political problem, to be able to rule a country with it, based on his wisdom. And so there's also this conflict between philosophy, politics, and, and the family, the man's origins. And it's all contained in the life of Oedipus. And as we move to Antigone, you'll see that these conflicts Reemerge. You know, somehow reasons at odds with the family, the politics is at odds with, with the family. And there's no way to make these things cohere. They're simply in conflict with one another. And you have to order them, you have to rank them somehow. Uh, conflict is, is, is uh, in, in that sense, you could say it's, it's tragic. You know, there's no, no resolution to it. Now, I, I want to move to Antigone now. Uh, and uh, this is the last of the trilogy. And uh, she's the most loving of all of his sons and daughters. His sons, of course, abandon him completely. He curses them, and then uh, they end up killing each other. Uh, they fulfill the curse and kill each other. Uh, and Ismene is not as loving to Oedipus. But Antigone, uh, after he blinds himself and he was exiled, you know, she's his eyes and Cain, and she, you know, uh, she supports him in his old age and suffers with him. And she couldn't just abandon her father. You know? uh, and a lot of people could do that, but she, she couldn't. Uh, and the story uh, of Antigone begins after the Civil War is taking place. Um, she has two brothers, Eteocles Ate and Polynices, and they inherit Thebes. Uh, and they fight for who will rule Thebes. So there's a civil war between the two brothers. And uh, Polynices uh, is exiled, and he goes to Argos, and he comes back with an army to claim the, the throne, and uh, the brothers kill each other. And Creon, who is the uncle of Antigone, the sister of Jocasta, who was the wife of Oedipus, it's hard to keep all these things straight, but uh, you, know, you kind of have to to make sense, of it, make sense of the play. Creon lays down a law that says traitors are not to be buried. So Polynices, who, you know, who, who, who left and, and made an alliance with Argos to crush his own city, is of course a traitor, uh, and he's not free buried. So his body is left out in public, uh, and it's to be eaten by crows and you know, dogs, you know, uh, and he doesn't want to honor the body because he thinks that uh, you know, there's no punishment that uh, can be bad enough for a traitor because the, the country, or the fatherland, is the greatest, the highest thing. Uh, and furthermore, he doesn't want any kind of equality to exist between 
honorable men who fight for the country and traitors who, who defy the country. Uh, and he's merciless, you know, even though the body is dead, even though the enemy is defeated, he won't show any mercy whatso whatsoever. Uh, and so he becomes filled with a kind of hatred and he desires to humiliate the body as much as possible and make sure it receives no honor whatsoever. Uh, and so Antigone and Ismene, Ismene is her sister, have to face this dilemma. Should we bury our brother or should we allow him to sit out there and be eaten by dogs and, and crows? Uh, why is that an interesting question? You know, why begin the play with this dilemma that these two sisters have to face? What, what's so interesting about the burial of a body and uh, whether or not you know, it gets eaten or cremated? You know, or, you know, it, you know, what's, why care? Why, why, why write a whole tragedy about something like that? You, know? uh, you, you, know, you could say, well, it's dead. What's the difference? Uh, yeah, we, are you asking? <laughs> that was a good question, yeah. yeah. Perhaps the, you know, the family, family loyalty versus uh, the rule of law. Or the... Yeah, that's a theme, obviously, if you wanted to develop a wife, why, why you're, this has something to do with family loyalty or testing the family bonds. Uh, what, what exactly is being tested here by putting someone in this, this kind of situation? I mean, obviously, as often think, this is a very revealing situation. If you face this situation, you're, you're going to learn something about it yourself and morality if you face the situation. Uh, anybody else? Divine law versus man's law? Yeah, divine law and, man, and conventional law obviously is part of this theme. Uh, what is it that man belongs to? Um, uh, well, if you, if you just allowed your, your relative to be eaten, eaten alive, or you, sorry, while they're dead, you know, just allow their body to be de desecrated in such a manner, uh, but that affect your love for them? Is this, is this a test of love or loyalty? Why is it a test of love or loyalty? Yeah. Yeah. It's a question of do you love um, the family member or the state more? Or do you love yourself, I guess, more? You know, for yeah. self-protection. Mm -hmm. The memory. You know, yeah, the memory of the dead. Yeah, the love. You know, the, the love, love requires a belief in, in continuity, the belief that, uh, you know, you, you're, you're honoring them, they'll, they'll, somehow they recognize you're honoring them, uh, that there might even be reunion in the afterlife. I mean, she believes all these things. Uh, she believes that the dead go to, to Hades, that they become godlike themselves, that they, to love your, your family, you must, uh, you must honor them in, in this, this way, according to these divine laws. And so to break with these divine laws would mean to break with the divine burial laws. It's really to break with the, with the family. It's to invite a curse upon yourself. You know? um, and we, we see that Antigone can't live that way. Her, her, she, she needs to, to love. She needs to be part of the family. Uh, she can't, she could endure breaking with her family to have her belief that her brothers hate her or that they would hate her. Uh, she wants to honor the love between them. Uh, so it doesn't matter to her if he was a traitor or not. What matters is the blood bond and the, the connection through birth with their, their brother, their sister. These are the things that count. And she believes that there's a divine law that supports these things. And from her love, she believes that there's a law supporting her love. That there's a divine order supporting the connection between the familial members. And to break with that law, of course, would invite punishment. To break with that law would uh, be a familial break that she's, she just can't make. You know? Her whole identity is connected to, to the family. And she's preparing herself for the sacrifice she must make. She realizes there's been this law passed. She realizes she, for her, there's no choice. Now she must bury the, the dead body. And for her, that means she has to face her own death. She has to be willing to, to die herself. And so she's also uh, willing to recognize there has to be sacrifices for love as well, for familiar love. And uh, she's willing to make that, that sacrifice of her own life. 
Uh, now, of course, she expects the same of her sister. But she says, you know, we have to do this. You know, uh, and her sister says, no, you have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have this, this, this big conflict between the two sisters uh, and between what should be obeyed. You know, the, the, the decree from the ruler, Creon, saying you can't bury the body. Uh, or should you obey the divine law that says, you know, the dead uh, are entitled to the burial of rights and the family has to should, uh, bury their members. You know, uh, and it's, it's a very interesting uh, conflict between the two. And you see that Ismene is, is very fearful. So you have at the very beginning these two sisters, one is an embodiment of love to a very great extent, the other embodiment of, of fear. Uh, and uh, Ismene said, you know, haven't you learned from all the sufferings our family's gone through? You know, our father slept with his mother, you know, and uh, gave birth to his own s sisters and brothers, you know, and our brothers just killed each other, you know. Uh, what, what should you learn from all of this? And Ismene's conclusion is, uh, which what she's learned is, to stay alive. You know, don't break laws, try to stay alive, be safe. Uh, and what Antigone learns, is, what Antigone's lesson is, that uh, we're a cursed family, but we stick together even though we're cursed, you know, and uh, we prepare ourselves for the worst, you know, uh, and we, we're a, a people that should be ready to die and die for one another, uh, and um, they get uh, very different lessons from, from the suffering. You could say tragedy itself teaches these two different lessons, you know, on the one hand, the tragedy celebrates the noble heart, noble heart of Antigone, uh, her, her love, uh, we pity her suffering. On the other hand, when you see these tragedies take place, you think, God, I don't want that to happen to me. You know, and uh, you know, should avoid the, these tragedies at all costs. Uh, so there really is a kind of a, a dual effect that, that takes place from these tragedy, and, and Sophocles uh, you know, examines that even at the at the, at the very beginning. Uh, now, one 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 sister is obviously all very noble. The other is baser. Love and sacrifice are noble things. Fear and self-protection, and wanting to stay alive, obviously something less noble. And Sophocles makes us, I mean, I think, immediately sympathize with Antigone and uh, her, her, her noble heart. Uh, but they have a debate between the two. Uh, and you see this debate between the divine law and the conventional law, and which one's higher, which should inform, which should inform the others. Uh, and, you know, Ismene, although she's, she's fearful and cowardly, you know, she just doesn't want to be thought of as fearful and cowardly. So she makes arguments in defense of herself. She wants to have a nobility of her own. She just doesn't want to be called a bad sister. She just doesn't want to be cursed by her, her family. She wants to have it both ways. She wants to remain part of the family, stay alive, uh, not break the divine law, not break the conventional law. Um, she wants to be fearful and self-protective, but she also wants to be somehow dignified and noble at the same time. Uh, but you can't have these things. I think, and that's human nature, to want all those things together. Uh, and we see, I think, with this Monet, ultimately it, it's a form of self-justification, sophistry, uh, and as the tragedy works itself out, you can see she can't have it. I forget which way. It's just, uh, it's just not possible. Now, uh, one of the ways in which she defends herself against Antigone is to say, what you want is impossible. I mean, there, there's this great argument between the two of them is uh, Antigone tries to persuade her sister to partake in, in, the, in the deed and therefore risk her own life, and it's almost quite certain that it'll be caught. Uh, and Ismene wants, says, you know, it's not noble to want what's impossible. So that if your love is not what you want to do, it's, it's, it simply can't be done. To which Antigone says, yeah, it, it can be done, but you might die for it, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, you don't know if it can be done or not, the burial or not, you know, unless, unless you try. Uh, and Ismene points out there is something wrong with wanting the impossible, but, she, you know, she finds all these arguments to undermine the nobility of Antigone, you know. Something that's impossible, if someone, if someone wants the impossible, they're no longer noble, what are they? They're fanatical, yeah, and she's saying, you know, you think you're noble, you're really you're a fanatic. You know? And at one point she says, uh, Ismene says to him, your heart is too warm for cold deeds. You know, that you, you love this too much. 
know, uh, you're, you're, you're really, you've lost your reason. You're really too, too fanatical about this. Uh, and this is more about your glory than it is about your love. And so there's, there's a fine line between noble love and sacrifice and self-indulgence. And, uh, you know, Ismene, because she herself is fearful, she wants to undermine the nobility of Antigone. To say, you know, your nobility is not really real. You know, you're fanatical, you want what's impossible. And, oh, and by the way, this is really about you, it's not about them. It's not about your brothers, it's about you, you know. Uh, you want the glory, you know, of, of the deed. Uh, you want to be loved, you know. Uh, these are... These are, it's really ultimately, therefore, although there's some sacrifice involved, the motives are selfish, ultimately. Uh, and if the motives are selfish, how great is the deed? And there's not a question on the deed, really. You know, is it such a noble and great, great deed to perform? Uh, then Ismene, she also wants to partake in the nobility, even though she doesn't want to risk her life. So she wants to say things like, you've probably all ever been part of conversations like this. Uh, you have my blessing, you go ahead and do it. I promise I won't tell anybody. You know, uh, so it makes it sound like, I'm supporting you, you know, you, you, know, you go do it. Uh, and, uh, and Antigone, uh, her reaction is, tell the whole world. You know, uh, she wants everybody to know. She doesn't care if she dies or not. And she resents her sister for trying to partake in the nobility in any way while not performing the deed itself. She's a, she's a tough girl to get along with this Antigone. You know, you, uh, very demanding. Uh, if you're not sharing the deed, if you're not making the ultimate sacrifice, uh, she doesn't want you to share in it in any way. In fact, you should be humiliated. A curse should come down on you. you know? and um, you don't deserve to be part of the family, you know, and it's really, it's an either or, very much so. You're, you're friends, you're going to go forward with this, if you're not, you're an enemy. And you, you, you failed the family, uh, and we're not going to cut you any kind of slack. And of course, this Minet, that's what, exactly what she wants, she wants lots of slack. She, she makes the argument that the gods will forgive her, her her ancestor, you know, her, her brother will forgive her as well because uh, there was this law made by Creon. She was forced not to bury her brother, and so because she was forced, there's a kind of necessity here that excuses uh, excuses what she did. So uh, you have this this wonderful debate at the very beginning between the conventional law and the divine law, and it's quite clear that Sophocles thinks that. The divine law relates to the family, connect, connecting man to his birth, uh, is going to be a higher law, a more noble law. Um, and, uh, Ismene, in giving into the, the laws of her country and her fellow citizens, uh, is really not, not acting with a, a similar nobility, you could say. Uh, is, is there anything else you want to say about the divine law and the political law? And their, conflict between the two as it's introduced here. And the love love versus fear, it's conflict between love and fear you see in the yeah? On uh, well, it's line eighty six he says Antigone says the time in which I must please those that are dead is longer than I must please those of this world, for there I shall lie forever. Mm -hmm. I think that's very yeah. interesting. She's, she's more concerned with pleasing the gods and the an ancestors. Yeah, she, be she believes that uh, yeah, death is eternal, and that's where she's going to end up. Uh, she's going to be, be with them forever. Whereas uh, the political laws, she doesn't think that thieves will be there forever. Uh, and uh, she certainly won't be living with the living forever either. And she thinks that that's right, that this love will be something eternal. That's right. Uh, and therefore she should concern herself with it. Whereas fear, is not eternal. It's, it's something temporary. Uh, once you die, obviously you're free from it. <laughs> you know, you could, you could say. Uh, and uh, yeah, Antigone is much. Uh, Ismene is much more concerned with just staying alive, preserving herself. Of course, Aunt, but your body is an eternal. So she's more concerned with something that's not eternal. Her, her body, self-preservation, something eventually she's going to have to give up. Yeah. 
Yeah. It seems like there's a couple dichotomies that are quite interesting. There's a lot to do with the corporeal versus the not corporeal attributes of life. And yeah. also, um, what you were just saying about the you're in or you're out kind of attitude, isn't that why the brothers ended up falling out in the first place? You know, that, that, that similar kind of thinking, absolutist thinking, might have been a ha family habit that's creating this new problem as a yeah. result of the previous family discrepancy. Yeah, but, but uh, that's, that, though, uh, I think for Sophocles' life, you are in or you're out, because uh, they were fighting for who, could, who would be the ruler. Can't be two rulers, you know. You're either a ruler or you're not a ruler. And you're either in or you're out, you know. And uh, the younger brother, Heracles, took over the kingdom. And so the older brother said, well, I thought it was his birthright. Um, and, uh, you know, they obviously could not share power in any way. So it really was an either or. Yeah, and it led to war. Uh, where where you, you seem to be suggesting there doesn't have to be such conflicts. It's just a way of thinking in, in or out. It's yeah. just a way of thinking. It, it, and, yeah. and one that previously happened in the same family. It, it seems to be a habit within this clan. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's not just habit. I think, though, there, this, this clan is an embodiment of the human situation. You know, this family goes through uh, the conflicts that are just natural to man, I, th I think, to a very, to a very great extent. Um, and it, they, they live out those conflicts. Uh, <clears throat> now you can say, well, right now, of course, we're not in a civil war at all, but uh, you, can, you know, we were at one time in the United States, we had a civil war, and we couldn't tolerate slavery. You know, and you were either you know, you slaveholding or you weren't slaveholding. You know, and uh, you were either you're in or you're out. And there's, sometimes there's just uh, no possible compromise on principles. They just clash, they just conflict. Uh, and for, for Sophocles, that's the, the nature of, of existence. Uh, the, the family is, creates a kind of connectedness between human beings. Politics creates another kind of connectedness between human beings. Later on, we'll see there's also love as well. And love, family, politics, these things just don't cohere. They're just in conflict with each other. You know? um, they have different principles. They're different relations. They're mutually exclusive from one another. Uh, uh, and in each one, you're in or out. Yeah, with each one, you're in or out. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and this is a, a, kind of an examination of those things. So that's just part of tragic conflict. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a necessary conflict. It's not an accidental conflict. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, Antigone's nobility. Depends on uh, her acceptance of fate, and that these kind this is necessary. But her nobility yeah. couldn't, couldn't have nobility if he didn't accept that. Is that what you also thinking? Yeah, she, she, she's willing to accept that uh, she's going to have to die for this. That's right. And she doesn't think she can have, have it both ways. Uh, and she's, she's willing to accept that. I think the idea of fate is extremely alien to us. That's hard to digest. Or dying. Yes. Or, or having to die is the alien to us. That's right. The necessity of death is alien to us. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we only, uh, there's a famous philosopher named Montesquieu who said that uh, uh, men only die by accident. Uh, <laughs> that's the idea that death is something that can always be prevented. You know, and anytime someone dies, I like to give the example of my uncle who was 95. And when he died, he had open heart surgery in his late 80s. Uh, and when he finally died at 95 years of age after having open heart surgery and all kinds of illnesses, everyone said it was an accident. That if the ambulance had gotten there earlier, he'd still be alive today. You know? And that's the, the way we think about death. That we always think, well, there was a stop sign there. This didn't have to happen. Or, you know, if they put more money in health care, this didn't have to happen. You know? and, we always think about the preventative measures uh, rather than the fact that, no, it's inevitable, it's necessary. Uh, and, and for Sophocles, part of educating man means to, to stick the necessity for death in his face. That this is necessary, you have to face it. There, there's no science, there's no art that's going to get you out of this. Um, it's just a it's natural inevitability. It cannot be, cannot be, cannot be avoided. Yes. 
compound. Okay. Well, I was just thinking that Highbold attempts the middle ground, doesn't he? Uh, yeah. He appeals to his father and mm -hmm. attempts to avert the, what is out to be inevitable. So ultimately, he's yeah. unsuccessful. But he mm -hmm. comes to reason. He 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 looks to find a middle ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Creon, of course, uh, repudiates, mm -hmm. and uh, he meets uh, the disaster and uh, and uh, kill, uh, kills himself, saying that the yeah. is now gone. But right. He, so it, it's um, that attempt to find the ground doesn't work. Yes, I, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, and if there were middle grounds, it would undermine the tragic effect that Sophocles wants, because you, everything would just be a matter of, of haggling. <laughs> 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 well, let me bury half his body, uh, let me stay alive. You know, you know, we, it'd be all deal-making, you know? Uh, and and uh, middle grounds, uh, uh, you can say that, that there, there's kind of moderation of prudence there in reaching middle grounds. He right? appeals to reason. Yeah. It does appeal to reason, but for that very reason, it's not, it wouldn't be tragic anymore. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, Sophocles doesn't want to let go of the tragedy. He refuses to rationalize tragedy and to allow it to be rationalized. Uh, I think we've done that to a very great extent. We've rationalized tragedy very, very much. Uh, you know, what, what would happen if, if um, someone, you know, Oedipus slept with his mother in the modern day, you know? Did it work a child? It happened, yeah. <laughs> you have a, I don't know, a divorce arrangement. Maybe you go into a little bit of therapy or something. You know, uh, uh, and, uh, but everyone will come around and give them a support group. You know, it's not so bad, man. You know, these things happen. Uh, let's get on with your life. Enjoy life. What's your problem? You make a reality show. Yeah, right. You can make money off of this thing. That's right. You have a great story. The world wants to hear it. You know, everything is great. That's right. Creon could have avoided the tragedy by being more moderate. He could have given the Teocles a state funeral, but allowed the family to bury Polynices privately and you know, off someplace without many people. Uh, yeah, there'd be no tragedy at all if, if, that, were, if that were the case. Uh, well, yeah, why do you think he, made, he makes that law, though? I feel well, he thinks it's for the good of the city and to solidify his own rule, I think. Yeah, uh, for the good of the city. Uh, yeah, there's a, obviously the, the city too has its gods, and they believe that the city was led to victory um, by the gods. Uh, the, the chorus makes a speech. But it seems he could have safeguarded the interests of the city and still given the family its due. But instead mm -hmm. you've got Antigone on behalf of the family and the gods that ordained what is proper for families, mm -hmm. and Creon standing up for the city and mm -hmm. the gods that love justice. Uh, mm -hmm. And you've got just a complete chasm between the two. Yeah, the, I don't think the chasm is just an accidental chasm. I think that uh, there are reasons that Creon had to, to make the, those laws. Um, one is uh, he believes that the, the city is blessed by gods. It has its own gods. Right? Uh, and that he would be dishonoring the gods of the city and the victory that they brought to him if he gave honor to, to a traitor. And if he treated traitors and worthy citizens the same way. You know, and he feels he can't give uh, honor to both of them. Uh, and even Antigone kind of backs off. She has a difficulty with that argument. She realizes this really is a problem. And she just says, well, who knows what the gods want? You know, she, can't, she can't deal with the question either. Uh, and so he feels the need to affirm the city. Uh, and part of the affirmation of the city is to honor those who, who uh, honor the city, honor those who sacrifice for the city. And you know, can you really, you know, honor a traitor? Who, and it was a terrible. He was a terrible traitor. I mean, just didn't sell secrets to spy or something. He went out, and uh, he got a foreign army, the enemy city. He led them against his own motherland, and he tried to burn it to the ground and destroy it. You know, uh, it's hard to give a guy like that, you know, an honorable state funeral. You know, uh, <laughs> the private so, funeral. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was suggesting. Yeah. Uh, wasn't this supposed to be an uh, alternation of the ruling so that Antiochus should have given up the uh, the throne to his brother? And so his brother has some argument to make, 
which may have been mm -hmm. appealing to certain elements within Thebes. Oh, absolutely. So, so, so in this situation, yeah. post Civil War, where there is something to uh, uh, colonize his position, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very important that Creon yeah. uh, establish a very firm position yeah. and put down any elements within Thebes yeah. that may be uh, supported. Yes, yeah, so that's a good point, Tom. Actually, that's excellent, because he, he, he says that himself. Yeah. He says that, you know, uh, I, there's an enemy faction here, the followers of Polynices, you know, who still exist in Thebes, that's right. Uh, and, you know, he obviously can't honor uh, the, the, you know, the symbol of the enemy faction. That's right, he would give them some kind of legitimacy, I think. And or encouragement. Or encouragement, yeah, and he feels the need to really dig his heels in. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, works against him, of course, because he becomes inhuman in his hatred. Uh, to the point where he loses his own friends. You know, they see that he's gone, he's gone too far here. Uh, and that uh, obviously you, uh, even with respect to your enemies, you have to give them some pity or some, some element of honor. Uh, but Creon becomes a, a monster, a tyrant, I think. And he, he deserves his fate in the end. Uh, he, he becomes a, he's the bad guy, I think. And, uh, but uh, you know, he has his reasons, though, I think, for acting the way he acted. Yeah, I think if you take a look at his uh, initial speech to the, uh, to the Senate, mm -hmm. I think there I don't see so much evidence of retirement, although mm -hmm. during the course of yes. the society, that does come out. That, oh, he that, becomes that, a tyrant. He, he does, does, play, yes. but, but that opening speech, um, you know, has has something uh, in it. Uh, it it mm -hmm. might be seen as a, a prudent speech. Uh, given the, the, the situation. situation. It's it's the course. The course is is, is yeah. a convinced one. Yeah. It's very effective. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, a prudent and patriotic speech. Yeah, very patriotic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, discussing uh, you know, his own ancestry and how he's because he's a legitimate king, uh, and uh, talking about. Uh, the rule of law and the need for obedience and the, mm -hmm. the need to you know, reward those who are loyal, punish those who are disloyal, all those things, yeah. And definitely the, the, uh, the old men of the Senate, they actually go along with it. And they're his supporters at that point. You know, he's going to lose their support. And he, and he pushes it too far. Uh, and that's kind of interesting too, you know, when, um, why can't, patriotism obviously is not something absolute either. You know, it, it does come, it simply conflicts with the family. And the, the Senate, you know, uh, they go back and forth, you know, with this conflict. You know, at first they're they're all for the country, you know, the, the, the patriotism is the highest thing, devotion to it, uh, uh, rather, uh, you know, uh, disloyalty cannot be excused. But by the end of the play, of course, they sympathize with Antigone, and uh, they, they feel the the force of the, the familial claims. They feel the force, the claim of love as well. And they they make a speech in praise of Aphrodite. Uh, uh, you know, you, you see them, they're, they're conflicted as well. These conflicts are lived out, not just amongst the characters, but the Senate itself, and it's waffling. You know, sometimes siding with politics of the country, sometimes siding with the family, sometimes siding with love. Uh, they're, they're really torn, they're very torn as well. As I think the audience, as often as you would expect the audience to be, the course is almost like an audience watching we go through all these different uh, kinds of passions. Uh, yeah. It's, it's just a, a small thing, and I, and I, is there a particular reason why you're comparing these plays to Shakespeare? I, it seems that is a particularly Shakespearean dilemma. The ruler who starts out seeming very wonderful and reasonable, and then mm -hmm. puts himself in a position where he ends up not being a sympathetic character any longer. Yeah, no, the, uh, it's kind of by chance. I mean, I didn't choose the, the books themselves, but I think they do. Uh, Throw light on on one another. Yeah, this is. Uh, I mean, Shakespeare took a lot from Sophocles, I believe. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, it's not just a Shakespearean dilemma. I think it's 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 a it's a tr it's a tragic dilemma. I'd like to say, you know, uh, you know, why a king? Why is a king such an interesting character? Uh, well, a king must be like a god, you know. And we'll see here that uh, ultimately Creon thinks of himself as a god, you know. He's a ruler. These are his decrees. If there's any disobedience to him, that means that someone has a higher claim to him. You know, he, he can't allow any uh, 
disloyalty to him, he can't allow any um, insolence towards him because it would undermine his authority. Uh, and eventually, the kingship defines his identity. You know, he is a king. You know, he is his authority. You know? uh, and if you were to take away that authority, you would take away from him what he thinks of himself as. Uh, and the question, therefore, is: Can man live as a king? You know, or is, is being a king an illusion of a kind? You know, for a man to think he's a divine being that he can make these decrees, that other men must bow to those decrees. If they don't, uh, you can't even listen to their reasons. It's, if, if, they have, if they try to justify themselves, they're just being insolent, because your will is the divine will, you see. Uh, that happens with his son. You know, his son, just to question the father, you know, is a form of insolence. You know, there's absolutely no excuse, simply. And the same with Antigone. There's absolutely no excuse to defy his will. Uh, and so eventually, and this becomes the problem for the king, he has no higher law that he, ends, he can follow. I mean, his will becomes the law. You know? uh, 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 if he wills it, it, it is. You know? uh, he is what he is. He says what he says. He, eventually, he needs no justifications uh, because he simply is like a god. And so the, the story of Creon's tragedy here is, is a man who strove to be godlike through his kingship. And then he realizes he's just a man, he's crushed at the end, you know. Uh, loses his son, his wife, everything that was close to him. He realizes uh, that he was just a human being with these connect connections, that he's going to die himself, that he was weak and vain. Uh, and uh, he has to face his own pride and his, his impossible ambition to be a god. That's all, that's all sort of his tragedy within, within the story. Does that help clarify? Uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So kingship is an important part of both Shakespearean tragedy and of um, Sophocles as well. The Shakespeare famous example, King Lear, you could say, is a famous example of that. You know, a man who who understood himself as a, as a god, and eventually, you know, he sh his his daughter strip him of everything. He realizes he's just a man. And yet he set it up for himself. He, yeah, that's right. He put the wheels in motion that caused that tragedy. Yeah, he, he thought he could be. Uh, that's right. Uh, a god who, who was aloof and, and, and uh, controlled everything while giving up the, the power, the, uh, the temporal powers, exactly, and, and destroys himself. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, yeah, the, uh, the century comes. So we, we talked about, you know, Creon and his, his decree, why he makes that decree. I think he had, he had good reasons, political reasons to make Make that decree. Um, eventually, he, he breaks with those reasons. He, he, he's on the, he just ends up asserting his will, though. And then we'll have to watch how the transformation takes place. And why that's the nature of politics for Sophocles, that um, eventually the leader has to be, usurp the powers of a god and the authority of a god. You know? uh, he, he'll, really, he'll reach a point where he no longer speaks as a patriot concerned with the common good. Uh, whatsoever, and he only speaks of his authority. He only speaks of punishing those who defy his authority, and that's the, the final position he's going to take. Uh, so this movement from patriotism to tyranny, and kingship to tyranny, I think is is very very interesting. Uh, I think it's a necessary development in uh, in Socrates' mind. Now uh, the century, the, he's almost a, he's a comic figure. The century. Uh, he gives these comic speeches about uh, how he was hurrying, slowly hurrying, you know. He calls himself a fool. He calls himself a fool, that's right. Poor fool yourself, why are you going somewhere? Well, once you get there, you will pay the piper, you know. Uh, and uh, what's this, this dilemma? Does anyone remember this, the century, his, his problem? He's an interesting character, I believe. Uh, well, what, what has happened is uh, the body's supposed to be guarded so no one can bury it. And these guys are pretty slack, you know, uh, these are like Keystone Cops or something. And uh, Antigone's able to, to go in there unnoticed and just throw some dust on the body, just enough to cover the skin so that the birds and the dogs won't eat, won't eat the body. Uh, and then she disappears, and all of a sudden the guards turn and there, there's the body covered. And they've all realized that there's, there's trouble now, you know. Uh, we were told to. To guard the body, make sure no one buries it, and then now it's buried. 
uh, and they're not sure what to do. Um, they, pro they, they probably should just take the dust off. <laughs> yeah, why do you think they don't do that? I mean, the sensible thing for them to do is just go out there and get a hair dryer and blow it all over or something. Uh, get a dust buster, yeah, suck it up, yeah, exactly. Uh, but they don't do that. Uh, and uh, they, they pull straws, whoever gets the shortest straw has to go tell Creon the king the body is buried. And, and this poor sucker, he drew the, sh the sh you know, short end of the stick. Uh, and you know, he, he, he's, he's afraid that Creon will put him to death. You know, that, uh, well, he did not, didn't do his duty, you know. Uh, and people killed messengers all the time, and he's terrified. Uh, and uh, he thinks, well, maybe he, he deliberates with himself. I'll just run away. But he realizes he, he, he can't run away either, because Creon will find out, and if he runs away, it will just make him look guilty. And then for sure he'll be put to death. But if he goes and sees Creon, well, then he might die that way too. Uh, and he's, he's in this dilemma, and he decides just to go see, see Creon for, for, for the best. Uh, and he's, he's a man full of fears uh, and confusions as well. Uh, you want to talk about his state of anxiety when you're in such a situation where it seems like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. You know, if I, if I run away, I'm damned. Uh, if I go forward, I'm damned. I, my life is at risk here either way. And I did nothing wrong, and I'm in a situation where I'm going to be killed. And, and his problem is how to, how to come to a decision of what to do. Are there, are there times when man's reason is just weak and can't do anything for him? Or there's just, your life is just up to chance. You know, you're thrown in a situation where uh, you can only reason so much, and you, you can reason only so much, that, and your reason tells you there's no, there's no choice, there's no sensible choice you can make, <laughs> and there's nothing you can do, uh, then you, what to do? Uh, well, you know, for him, he just obeys orders and just goes forward with, you know, uh, since he, he sees that there's nothing he can he can't control his fate anyway. Uh, and uh, here, you know, so again, selfishly shows you the weakness of reason when it comes to comes to man's fate uh, and figuring out your fate. You know, there are times when you you can't figure out what to do, and you just have to roll the dice. And uh, although there there can be no reason for you taking an action, you have to act. You have to do something. You know. Uh, and so he bumbles along, you know, and uh, he ends up doing something without any confidence in what he's doing, not having any confident, you know, no courage in what he's doing, you know, and uh, just kind of uh, hoping for the best. And he knows his life is in Creon's hands, uh, and so he prepares Creon for it, you know, very, very slowly. Uh, he prepares him for, for, the, for the bad news. Uh, and ultimately he says, you know, the body has, the body has been buried. Uh, and the chorus, once the body's been buried, how do they, you remember how they react? They say, uh, perhaps a god wanted it. You know, the chorus says, my lord, I wonder, could this be a god's doing? Uh, why, did all, why did the chorus suddenly sway? You know, all of a sudden they think, maybe the, god, the gods are involved in this. Uh, what happened there? Why did the, the chorus suddenly break with Creon? Maybe the gods are siding with Polynices. Uh, they want the, the, the body buried. Uh, they obviously think there, uh, there was something wrong with denying a burial. You know, they realized that there was something inhuman about this. They themselves have a bad conscience about it. And now Creon is on the defensive. He's going to slowly take his steps towards tyranny now. Um, the Senate, who's in part the voice of public opinion, is beginning to go against him. Uh, the fact that they thought the gods were involved in this shows that they're a little uneasy about denying the burial. Uh, they might even be sympathetic to the burial, thinking that this is something that should be, perhaps. Uh, and Creon really digs his heels in. He calls the, the senators a bunch of foolish old men for believing that gods would want such a thing. How could the gods want this? Uh, he was a criminal. He was dishonorable. And the gods could not possibly want once protect criminals. Then he says he starts to blame the rebels. Uh, 
And he says he blames he blames money. He says someone must have done it for pay for money. So from like 320 or so. He says the following. I'm very sure that these men hired others to do this thing. I tell you, the worst currency that ever grew among mankind is money. This sacks cities, this drives people from their homes. This teaches and corrupts the minds of the world to acts of shame. This displays, displays all kinds of evil for the use of men. He stressed on the knowledge of every impious act. Those that have done this deed will have been paid to do it, but in the end they will pay for what they have done. Uh, and uh, why, why, of all the things he could have said, why does he want to blame money for this? The, uh, the evils of mankind, the cause of their disloyalty, the cause for this disobedience to his law is the money dollar. That's what corrupts man, is the, is the dollar, is the money. Why? What do you think that? Then why not say, well, it's probably Antigone, you know? It was, <laughs> that's, it's a relative, you know? Uh, is it Marxist? <laughs> is it Marxist? <laughs> <laughs> it's Marxist, that's right. <laughs> well, then you can, you can find them and punish them. You can punish them and avoid such things. What do you mean? What, 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 I'm not sure about Well, I mean, you can always see. Okay, Richard, this is what Richard finished point, yeah? Yeah, no, um, I mean, uh, he, under, he misunderstands the motive terribly. They terribly misunderstand the motive for this, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, why is that? Yeah. Because uh, he doesn't want it to be his sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well, what he's saying. Uh, his, his niece. Uh, Antigone is his, his, his niece. Yeah. yeah, well, what I'm saying is the character of the motive. Mm -hmm. he, he misunderstands terribly. He, the higher motive, that you can't, you can't just eliminate through threats, threats yeah. of punishment. Mm -hmm. that you can't just eliminate that. Mm -hmm. You know, she's willing to die. Yeah. That, that's, that's out of his, yeah. his he, can. Yeah, he doesn't want to believe there could be any noble motive for disobedience to him and his decree. Uh, he wants to believe it has to be based. This must be rebels who hate me, who I'm in a you know, civil war with. Uh, or it must be mercenaries that they've hired. Right. He has to bring uh, the motives into, within his control. Yeah. yeah. The love of the nobles beyond anyone's. Yeah, if, so, if someone's going to die for something noble, you can't control you them. You can't. You can't. So he'd like to believe that uh, he has the power of God, that he has this power of punishment that will control everybody and bring them to, their, bring them to obedience in one way or another. He does say that uh, fate, fate, that fate actually. Uh, that he'll be in control of their fate. Yeah. Well, he just finished saying that the gods couldn't possibly disagree with his command. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and yeah. so the only motive, the only motive would have to be a criminal motive. Yes. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he's very sure that uh, the gods are on his side. He, yeah, he, he invokes them again immediately afterwards. Uh, it is as sure as I still reverence Zeus, know this right well, and I speak under oath, if you and your fellows do not find this man with his own hand at the burial and bring him here before me face to face, your death alone will not be enough for me. Uh, so yeah, he, he believes that uh, he alone has the gods on his side. I think that's right. I think it's interesting that, that he chooses money of all things, because for two reasons. One, he's a king. Therefore, he himself doesn't desire money, he desires power. He doesn't require money, but a, a poor man like a century could easily be swayed by the money, whereas a king like him would not be motivated by such a thing. He would be motivated by power, you know, the, the ability to, uh, to tyrannize. Yeah, or yeah, his, his glory. And, uh, his glory. His, his, authority, it, his authority. His authority. That's right. authority. Power, exactly. Uh, and I also really, think these are the motives of a poor man, you know, money man. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's interesting that he attributes money in particular to this man because for a poor man to amount enough wealth, he could challenge the authority of a king. And it's the only way that he, you know, it is, this man could never say, well, I'm related to the king, I'm going to be the next king. But mm -hmm. if he can amount enough wealth, he challenges the authority. Just like you could, you could see that happen in, uh, in Europe, it happened in, in France with the um, the middle class gaining enough wealth to essentially overpower the aristocracy and monarchy. Yeah, I don't think he. Th I don't think he thinks that the people who've been paid off by money, these mercenaries, are going to rival his kingship. I th what I do think he thinks is that um, 
money is a petty motive that makes people disobedient. You know, that uh, they would obey the king, they would obey the decree, uh, but they have their their petty greed. Uh, and uh, you know, money is something. It's a base motive that people succumb to, uh, and and do these deeds. Uh, will perform low deeds for. Uh, so I think, and in that sense, he sees money as, as a corruption. Uh, I believe that people don't belong to him, they don't obey him and his will because they're following their own desires, their own interests uh, for the money. Uh, we also see him become tyrannical here as well because um, he starts blaming the messengers, threatening them that he's going to hang them. Uh, that will teach you in the days to come from what you may draw profit safely from your plundering. Uh, it's not from anything and everything you can grow rich. You will find out that ill-gotten gains ruin more than uh, than they say. Yeah, and so he is making an accusation against the century here. Yeah. Um, he's very suspicious of him. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of uh, his intemperance? I mean, he really jumps the gun here. You know, he's willing to, to look to tell the century, you know, I think you did it. I think you did it for money, you know, uh, and I'm going to hang you, you know, if you don't bring somebody here. Uh, and he's already, he's becoming, making these false accusations already. That's politics. That's Stalinistic politics. Yes. <laughs> the punishment doesn't fit the crime. <laughs> no. Yeah. There, there's no crime here. I mean, he was, was completely innocent. Yeah. Uh, uh, what do you make of Creon's need, Creon's need to place blame? Why can't you just say, well, go ahead, have a search, we'll see what happens. You yeah. know, and we, we want to make sure we get the right guy, you know. Uh, uh, procedures. Yeah, go through the procedures. No, there's a rush to judgment here. <coughs> and, you know, it says, if you don't find somebody who's guilty, you're guilty. So, uh, if you don't find somebody to hang, you're going to hang. Mm -hmm. You know, basically what he's, what he's saying there. Right? And of course, this can cor corrupt the whole, the whole regime, obviously. False accusations coming from, from the top down. Did he, can, can you reflect on his need, his rush to judgment, his need to punish? Um, loses his reason completely here. He's, he's clearly in the wrong. Well, every insult to his authority, every imagined insult to his authority, he's punished with death. He wants to yeah. punish your team with death, not a messenger with death. Yeah. Yeah, it's become personal now. Uh, it's about him and his authority. Uh, you feel that his authority is challenged. That's right. Um, also, he's been publicly defined. He made this decree, and someone has broken it. Uh, why is that interesting now? I mean, the, the important thing for him is to hang somebody rather than to find the right person. Because yeah, now it's... So there's always a political imperative for heads to roll. Yeah, that's right. Something that happens, you know, have to find yeah. a scapegoat immediately in order to resolve the problem at least on the surface, and everybody knows that might not be the person. Right. But it's expedient for some more to, to, to yeah. actually have somebody take some blame. Yeah, it's it's expedient, uh, not for the guy who's hanging, uh, but uh, yeah, he, he cannot have his, his authority publicly defined. I mean, everyone will know that this is taking place. Everyone will know that he's defied. If he doesn't hang someone quickly, uh, it'll, sh it'll show weakness. Uh, and he can't show any weakness whatsoever. Uh, so someone has to pay the price, and someone has to, has to pay it quickly. Uh, and sure, he's willing to sacrifice an, an innocent uh, in, in order to do that. Uh, it's just, yeah, part of politics. Yeah. It's part of, part of authority, part of maintaining authority. So it's absolutely necessary. Uh, now, once he's done all this and he's made all. Okay. Mark, as a statesman, though, he seems imprudent. As a leader, yeah. as a political leader, he, he doesn't seem prudent. I mean, mm -hmm. rushing to judgment here doesn't seem prudent. Um, I would argue that his initial decree was imprudent. Mm -hmm. Because he forced people to choose between the law and justice and the duties to family, mm -hmm. piety to the gods. Right. So you, you, you would uh, you would continue you you'd make the point it's that yeah, his, his just, imprudence and his yeah. insecurity comes out more and more plainly as the action unfolds. And there's no necessity for this decree, you would say. 
I, I, uh, I really think that it was not necessary from the start. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I think yeah. his, his, his jumping, well, his, his, he doesn't seem mm -hmm. able to imagine the sort of thing that would motivate Antigone. If he'd been yeah. capable of imagining what would motivate Antigone, he could have accommodated it from the very beginning and avoided it. Right, yeah. but he can't do that because he believes in God. Uh, for him to be prudent, he would have to say, well, uh, it doesn't matter that this traitor just uh, you know, waged war against the, the, the sanctity of his own homeland. Yeah. Uh, the reason he's imprudent is he's a real believer in his, in his country. You know, he really believes that uh, the country is supported by gods. He believes that people owe themselves to their country. Uh, and uh, therefore, that uh, a traitor uh, deserves the worst punishment. And, and just as Antigone would have to break with love for her to not bury her brother, Priam would have to break with the love of his country and the gods to, and the gods to, to bury Polynices. You see? He'd have to say, well, that's no big deal, we'll just be prudent here, you know, and it doesn't matter that he's a traitor and he completely, you know, the, the father's country uh, and wanted to destroy it, you know. Uh, we just have to keep things orderly, you know. Uh, he, he wouldn't be the, the, a patriot. He wouldn't be a real lover of his country. He wouldn't believe that his lover, his country is, is something uh, he's born to, that he loves, that the gods protect, and that he's connected to this whole patriotic order. Does it make any sense? It uh, does, and, and, but in yeah. the circumstances, well, of course, we don't know the full circumstances. Uh, I, I still yeah. don't see why the one couldn't have received the statue, and the other could have received um, his little patch of ground. Uh, he could have, but then Creon couldn't be patriotic anymore. That would be true if the leader were very insecure. In his position, or religious. Which isn't, isn't, yeah. isn't Creon essentially uh, insecure? He, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's guilty of rash judgment, certainly. He's intemperate, but he, he's, I think he's fundamentally insecure because in Oedipus Rex. Now this uh, sounds like Oedipus, therapy, insecure. When Oedipus challenges <laughs> <laughs> Creon uh, for plotting against them, uh, Creon seems to be perfectly happy with the second uh, job. He says, why, why would I want your job? I mean, doesn't he say that? Now, unfortunately, though, he's stuck with the top job. And I, I think fear and insecurity uh, play a role here rather than, let's say, craving for power or will to power. Because mm -hmm. if that were in his character, why, uh, there would be, uh, you know, well, that one wouldn't lend any credibility to the speech that he makes to Oedipus when Oedipus accuses him of plotting against the king. He says, yes. oh, and there's no evidence that he was plotting against, uh, against Oedipus. No, he wasn't. Yeah. Uh, now, getting back to the whole idea of the insecurity, I don't think that's an adequate uh, explanation. He's, he's pious. I mean, he's the believer in Tiresias. You know, Creon yeah. is the one who goes to Delphi. Creon is the one who, who, who uh, almost never goes through, disagrees with Tiresias until Tiresias accuses him. <laughs> you know, he has a problem with him. Uh, but I, I believe it's his piety makes this, this necessary. Uh, and um, I mean, you speak of statesmanship and prudence. How do you think Creon would look at statesmanship and prudence? If you just step back and say, well, let's just do the prudent thing here. We'll satisfy Antigone, we'll bury the body, we'll satisfy these people and give them, uh, you know, if he was Obama, let's say, you know, uh, <laughs> and just want to be the prudent statesman. But God would be racist. <laughs> Uh, I mean, maybe me yeah. betraying the gods. Yeah, I think, Clark, you're, you're, you're taking a position, obviously, I think you're taking the position that the statesmanship and the prudence would have been the good, good route to take, that this tragedy could have been avoided. Uh, but from Creon's perspective, you know, why not take those things? And I think uh, it would destroy the thing he believes in the list for. Uh, I mean, it, would, it would destroy. Uh, the belief in the gods in his city. Uh, it would take all the meaning out of his life. The question is the roots of the power. Yeah, the roots of it, the legitimacy of it too, on which he's building this kingship. I think that's a good point. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and any religious beliefs in order to be successful? Uh, his, his religion definitely gets in the way of him here. Absolutely, that's, that's, I think that's true. Um, and, and for him, obviously, unlike Matt, the modern state, you know, we have a separation of church and state. Actually, and, the modern uh, ruler would probably give him a very elaborate ceremonial burial because he's dead and he's not competing anymore. <laughs> that's a reward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but do not compete with us. That's right. That's right. I mean, we, we learn that uh, it's always good to, to be nice, you know. Uh, that's uh, almost a rule of thumb with our, st our statesmen. Yeah. Uh, never, never push things to the point of, of, of hatred. You know, and always, it's part of democratic. Always find common ground. Always find compromise. You know, and that's I think the way, way we live our lives. And, and that's part of prudence is doing. That's not all prudence, of course, but that's also part of prudence. Isn't he also vindicating the gods when he also? And he says, there's a party in the of the city, rebels against my word and law, shakers of heads in secret. And he's, he's also in a situation where he thinks that there could be a conspiracy, of, uh, and there would be crimes, and if he, earlier Clark he said, you know, in, in attributing this to the gods, well then all the crimes would be crimes against the gods. Um, I don't see how he wouldn't behave in a way he's behaving. Yeah, there, there's a, he's, he's avenging the, the gods here as well, you know, he mentioned Zeus in particular. Um, so, uh, but I, th I think there's piety mixed in with his decree, uh, and I think that's what gets in the way of his prudence. Um, now, yeah, of course, the Machiavellian argument would be, well, why not be prudent? You know, get, get, get rid of these tragic conflicts as much as possible. You know, you just need the appearance of religion, you need the appearance of patriotism. You know, uh, but you should really be solidifying your power you know, in ways that are necessary. Machiavelli hasn't been written yet. No, I know he hasn't been written yet. <laughs> oh, well, you know, the, there were Machiavellians even before Machiavelli, though. You know, and, uh, but but don't the gods happened. themselves, aren't, aren't the gods themselves asking two different things? They're asking for the justice the city requires, but then perhaps other gods are asking for a sister to bury her brother. Yes, uh, I think that's a very good point. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's awful piece talks about that as well, that the problem polytheism is, that, is like that. Uh, in the polytheistic world, who do you pray to? They're different gods, they conflict with each other. Um, there's, there's no solution to it. Now, they can take different sides. Uh, it's not as simple as you know, Christianity, uh, you know, where you know, you know who God is, you know what his, what his decrees are, and that's it. Yeah, well, what, what consequences can you draw from polytheism? The fact that there are these gods, they conflict with each other. Um, that makes, it makes life all the more tragic, I, I, I think, uh, because of that. Dr. Kramer, yeah. to, uh, to further address Dr. Merrill's point, do you think that part of the reason that, that Creon could not give the traitor a familial burial rather than you know, celebratory warrior's burial is because essentially his family is the royal family, and to have the royal family burying a traitor would, would be a great political mistake to, to have others see that. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, oh, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Or the point? Yeah, he, he just said, uh, you know, why not have a, a familial burial rather than a political burial? No, I, I said, do yeah. you think that part of the reason he doesn't give him a familial burial is because essentially the, the family of the traitor is the royal family, and, and it would not be a wise political move to have others see them burying a traitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be. Uh, he's, he's certainly aware of the problem. He, Antigone is going to marry, was, it was the plan was for her to marry his son, so that there would be no other claims to the throne, obviously. Uh, and so that's a little incest, incestuous, too. I think she's, she's marrying her cousin. You know, this family, they just can't get away from it. You know? and, uh, uh, so yeah, he's definitely aware of the, the, the problem of, uh, of lineage, yeah, and that there are these other claims coming from, uh, from Antigone, that's true. Uh, anything else you want to say about uh, Creon and his, and his decree, and what, the necessity for the decree in his own mind, and why he makes it? Um, get to, would you have to be an atheist, I guess, to not make the decree. I mean, if you really believe that your country is sacred, it's connected to the gods, um, you know, would prudence be a kind of atheism? 
And you believe the gods are wrong? Is it possible that any of you are atheists? You can believe they don't exist if you're atheist. But <laughs> <laughs> it would certainly be relativism. <laughs> What's the question again? Well, can you believe they're wrong? Can you acknowledge their existence, but say maybe there was a miscommunication, I, I didn't hear correctly? Or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the oracle, yeah. The oracle always makes riddles, you know. Wrong interpretation, that text. You can, you can save, save appearances that way, I guess. Yeah. Can you give an example where, uh, uh, for us, that we would have such a such a respect for something, any, any example that comes to mind that would might give us a feel for, you know, whether no compromise would really be possible. Uh, well, we, we see these things in theocracies mainly, and you know, if you look at uh, in places like Iran, mm -hmm. I think there was a a woman who called a teddy bear Muhammad or something. Are you aware of this? Mm -hmm. And uh, they were calling for, for her to be put to death, uh, and you know, the, the god has been insulted, mm -hmm. you know, and. And any insult to the God must be avenged, mm -hmm. because uh, you know to insult the God means that, uh, and not to allow an insult to go punished, mm -hmm. uh, means you you no longer love the God. I mean, if you love something, you avenge an insult against it. Well, I was going to say that any crimes that we uh, crimes that we punish, or any crimes that we can think of that that still have that something. A murder. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we put people to death for murder, mm -hmm. although it takes a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to be. Now we have to be absolutely sure about it. It doesn't take them. I'm sorry? It doesn't take the, <laughs> the arm before they put them you, know, you have to be humane. Mm -hmm. You have to be humane about it, yeah, sure. Are you, are you, you wonder if we, do we believe in anything enough yeah, uh, to kill people? Yeah, a kind of crime that we would, you know, maybe some of it, uh, this kind of uh, piety will come out a little bit. Right. In America? Yeah. Any kind of crime you think of? Abortion. No. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of a, of a, of a parallel to the Terry Schiavo case. Oh, pardon me? The Terry Schiavo case. Yes. You know, keeping a person Our alive support. on the, the basis of their family's wishes versus what is law. And that was this mm -hmm. kind of a parallel situation. Well, I'm thinking about crimes against children. Uh, we, 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 still, we, still, we, still, we still believe that there are things that uh, are sacred and that any yeah. defilement deserves death. Uh, well, I don't death, but I mean, it's to just give a sense, you know, mm -hmm. what maybe is, you know, and certainly crimes against children. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. no, uh, even crimes against children, uh, these people in therapy, you know, uh, yeah. and uh, they're preventative measures, they serve their time, and there's like, you talk to the neighbors, this is a you know, predator, you know, mm -hmm. these kind of things. Mm -hmm. and, um, they're, they're, they're usually not excused, I think. It's harder to excuse them, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And there's indignation against them. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing like this whereby it, it's such an insult to, to the country that the body should not be buried. Mm -hmm. The body needs to be slaughtered as much as possible. Yeah, they mark them, but it's always, they, they capture utilitarian terms, like we have to know where they are. Mm -hmm. So let's put an uh, electronic chip in their heads or something, mm -hmm. you know, so we can monitor them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the familial feelings, I mean, people's feelings, uh, yeah. are not always so utilitarian. Yeah, that's true. That's the feelings are there. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. Feelings, not just the law. Yeah. I would say right after 9 11, the initial blank check, you know, happened, universal response, uh, given there was a statute of limitations on it, you know, ran out and everybody became prudent after that to make sure everybody, you know, true terrorists like everybody is friendly. But, uh, right after 9 11, immediately following, there might have been some sort of, you know, free on response. Yeah, we were very patriotic, yeah, uh, but we were, uh, we were still very uh, reserved, I think. We didn't go around, you know, killing Muslims, you know, or leaving waterboarding. Uh, what water country did you live in? <laughs> well, not here, I mean. Not here. There, we, there, was, there, there, there was, was quite a bit of rounding up going on where I was living. I don't know where you were. Really? <laughs> where were you? I was in California. Yeah? I don't think there was a lot of We had a lot of people on freeways with 
flags sticking out of their windows, and if you were on that's, board with a flag sticking out of the windows, people would pick you. Like, that's not rounding up, though. I mean, uh, Creon, he wants to hang somebody, you know, and someone's going to die. You know, and, uh, leave them buried. Yeah, and leaving bodies unburied. I mean, we never went that far. Oh, they used to be drawn on the court. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I don't think uh, we have the same pieties. Mm -hmm. They're not as strong. We're much more tolerant people. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a lot to push us. As well. uh, we're fearful. We're more fearful than we are pies, uh, and we're afraid. Well, if we start rounding up people, I could get rounded up, you know. And so our our fear for ourselves always moderates uh, so like our fanaticism. Pardon me? We're like Antigone's Yeah, we're more like Antigone, that's right. The, the fear always moderates our hatred. Can you think of the internment of the uh, Japanese? As yeah. A, you know, that kind of response, that really irrational, like, it's rounded up with people based on who they are, and they're mm -hmm. all traitors. Right, or potential traitors. Yeah, I don't think anyone thought they were, they were definitely traitors, right. but they could be. That's right. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's, a, I think, a better example. Now, uh, after the, the burial, the, the chorus gives this very, very famous speech about man and what is man. Uh, and it's, it's one of the most pious speeches in the whole play. Uh, it's on line 365. Uh, I want to read part of it because it's such an interesting speech, too. Uh, it praises man, but it also wants to show man's limitations. And that's part of the piety. Uh, to show that ultimately, man has to be a, a pious being or connected to God. Uh, many other wonders, none is more wonderful than what is man. It, it, that, it, that it is that crosses the sea with the south wind storming and the waves swelling, breaking around him in boring surf. He is again who wears away the earth, wilderness of gods and more of unwearied as the clouds went across her from year to year when he works her with the debris that comes from horses. So now he's talking about. It. What a wonderful being is man. He crosses the seas, he tills the land, he's marvelously clever, he's cleverer than all the other be uh, beings. You know, he uh, captures birds, he makes savage beasts king, he controls them, domesticates them, uh, and a horse. Uh, man is the being who's, who's developed the arts. He, ha he has reason, he gains power through these arts. He brings the world to serve him. He makes the other beings serve him. But there's one thing he has a problem with, and that is death. Only against death can he come on no means of escape. Of escape from hopeless diseases he has found in the depths of his mind. So even from disease he can find medicine and he can escape diseases. But from death itself, nothing will save him. Death is inevitable. It shows man his limitations. It shows the weaknesses of his arts, and therefore man's arts and his cleverness are really a, a form of false pride, according to this speech. Uh, we put too much hope in the arts. We think they can save us. Uh, we put too much hope in medicine, especially, thinking that, can, that that can save us. The arts have their limitations, and you know what is the reaction to the inevitability of death? Of course, uh, the gods. If he honors the laws of earth and the justice of the gods, he is confirmed by oath. High is, is his city. No city has he with whom dwells dishonor, prompted by recklessness. He who is so may he never share my hearth, may he never think my thoughts. Uh, so for uh, the chorus here, they want to have it both ways, too. They want uh, to obey the laws of the city. They want to obey the divine laws as well. They don't see a necess necessary conflict between these, these things at this point. Uh, and they think that piety is something, something easy. And part of this play, of course, is the, the, the chorus is going to give a lesson the problems of piety. As well, everyone gets a, gets a lesson by the end by the end of this play. Uh, 
in, the, in this sense, they're like Ismene. You know, she wants to have it both ways. Uh, and again, yes, and you see here, Clark, that uh, you know, the city and the gods are, are connected. Uh, they're connected together. And to, to, break, to break the decree would mean you'd have to give up on your city. And, and the gods, both. Now, uh, the sentry comes back, and he, he's found uh, Antigone. And he gives a speech about chance, saying, you know, I swore I would never come back here again. Because he was so thankful that he left with his life. He said, I'm never coming back here again. And then, of course, they find her, and he returns. Uh, he says, I hit the jackpot. You know, here she is. <laughs> this was my jackpot. Uh, uh, and, you know, everyone, of course, is stunned by it, and uh, you know, he tells a story about how they caught her, uh, and, you know, Creon, of course, starts cross-examining her, you know, did you do this? Uh, and, of course, she, she doesn't deny it, and she even, she even glories in it, and she's, of course, is going to make the case that she is obeying the divine laws, not the man-made laws, but the higher laws, or the laws of family and burial, that Creon's decree was not really divine, it was just a man-made law. And she makes the, the argument that these laws are, are eternal. They've always existed from time immemorial. Of course, Creon's decree was just something recently made. It hasn't really, uh, no way. Uh, she says, uh, it's about line 500, around 495, 495. Yes, it was not Zeus that made the proclamation. So she's saying, you know, the decree made was not by Zeus, it was your proclamation, nor did justice, which lives with those below, and acts to such laws as that for mankind. I did not believe your proclamation had such power to enable one who will someday die to override God's ordinances, unwritten and secure. They are not of today and yesterday. They live forever, and none knows when they, were, when they were first made. These are the laws whose penalties I would not incur from the gods, but fear of any man's temper. Uh, and she's clearly a, a girl who wants to be connected to the eternal. She, she believes there's an eternal order that she's following. It connects her to the dead. And that's where all men are destined to go anyways. And so the, the laws of a man you know, cannot deter her, nor can any kind of fear to her either, because she believes there's some better place to go to. Um, Richard, I think you described her as a suicide bomber, you know, and uh, Americans do have these problems dealing with these people who believe that there's another life, uh, that they're connected to something eternal. How can you stop them? You know, you can't bribe them with money, you, know, you can't put fear in them. Uh, you try to. Yeah, they try to. million dollar reward. Osama, yeah. Or find the causes. Find the root causes of it. Find the root causes, of, the root causes, the root causes of it, yeah. Okay. And if you can eliminate poverty, they're doing this because they're poor, you know, this, this kind of thing. Yeah, it's even not poor. Uh, I think he's not poor. But no, 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 neither is Bin Laden. He's not poor either. Nor are the people who are putting themselves up. Yeah. Bottom are uh, very wealthy. Uh, uh, and she, she, she has this connection to eternity that's the meaning of her life. And uh, she believes that if she were given to the fear, she would be disobeying the gods. She would be defiling the sentiments that, of love that connect her to her family. Uh, she'd be breaking with this, this divine order that's really the meaning of her life, that justifies her existence. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, she's not going to feel any guilt. Uh, and she she cannot be deterred in a way. Now, what's interesting about Creon is he wants her to feel guilt. You know, admit you did this. Uh, so, say you're sorry. You know, uh, why does he have to go through this? Why not just say, okay, you did it. Now we're going to kill you. Off you go. No, instead, it's, it's drawn out. She, you know, he wants to hear the re her reasons. He wants her to admit guilt. He tries to convince her of the guilt of what she's done. 
Uh, why does there have to be this dialogue of uh, this, this examination attempt to, to get more than a confession isn't enough that he did the deed, but also a confession of guilt and we're wrong. You know, the need to hear, and I was wrong. Yeah. Make her contrite, yeah. What does, he, what does he want that from her? Why is it not, not just enough to know that she did it and she was defiant? It's going to make him feel better. Yeah, do you, do you want to explain what, what's at stake for him? Why is, why is that going to make him feel better? Okay. Um, Yeah, it's connected to his ego. Yeah, she said that uh, he needs a he needs a, a vindication or confirmation of himself. It's about his ego. Yeah, uh, yeah he, he wants to believe that he's in the right. Okay. It can't just be an act of force. He doesn't want this to be tragic. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he wants to believe that he's in the right. And this is really uh, moral. Uh, that he really is a just ruler. That the order he's defending really is the just order of things. Uh, that you've broken with the just order of things, and what can about to happen to you, you deserve to suffer. And, and you and, and you yourself must admit you deserve to suffer. You know, I want to hear you say it. I deserve to, you know, I deserve this. You know, uh, I won't say. It. Yeah, she said, I won't say it. That's right. I go for this with my children. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just just a uh, Yes, <laughs> yeah, so there, there's a need to, to, to vindicate his order here. And of course for her, she needs to vindicate her order. And now you get to see these two different orders at odds with each other. You know, him and his patriotic order, uh, and, and his belief in patriotic gods who love the city, uh, and her with her belief in the familiar order, and a uh, man being you know, born and rooted in the family, not necessarily in the city. Well, where do the gods lie in such a case? You know, and they both have these, um, they're both making these claims. Um, her, her courage is impressive. You know, courage is something that's impressive to most people. And the certainty she has, the moral certainty she has, I mean, she has absolutely no doubt that she's doing the right thing. This is persuasive to the Senate, eventually. What do you make of that? People who are courageous in their cause, they're certain of their cause, they're courageous in their cause, they're going to sacrifice themselves. Uh, what, what is the power of, of, of such a person? I mean, she's, she ends up being quite powerful. She, I mean, the, the Senate starts to take her side. They're impressed with all, all this, this aspects of her. Admirable. Yeah, it's admirable. Yeah, well, yeah. What makes it so? What makes it so admirable? And, and why? Why? Why do people tend to look up to people who have this conviction and act on their conviction? Because they don't actually have it. Yeah, because most people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to elaborate? Yeah. Most people. Did Did you see the article by Malcolm Gladwell on the current issue of the New Yorker? No, I didn't on um, absolute certainty and how incredibly powerful it is in strategic negotiation, whether or not yeah. you believe it because you're deluded or just because you're a great poker player, and yeah. how it led to the current financial collapse. How did that lead to the financial career? What, what was the moral it's certainty? It's a brinksmanship thing. That, yeah. um, when you're playing it on an international stage, you can keep escalating and escalating to the point where there's no further you can go. And as long as there's a ladder up which you can go, it's actually an incredibly successful strategy. But when there's no further you can go, when there's a top to the tower, then it can have consequences that lead. Yeah, that was all kind of metaphorical towers and tops, you know. It was an interesting thought-provoking idea of yeah. just that there's this, this kind of negotiation that is particularly common among poker players and um, Wall Street mm -hmm. people, where they right. just have this appearance of being confident and 
Oh yeah, the confidence, the confidence man, yeah, that's right. And, and they did lots of blind studies where a person is gambling, pure chance, circumstances, mm -hmm. where they're gambling against this competitor, and mm -hmm. people will always gamble much more conservatively against someone who appears confident and knowledgeable, mm -hmm. and if they have the schlemiel, as <laughs> is the technical term apparently in this competition, against them, then they're much <laughs> bolder, even though yeah. there's absolutely no difference in their chances of success. Yeah, that's right. Uh, people lose their reason to these impressions. I think that's true. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and she's very impressive, extremely impressive, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, immediately turns uh, the public opinion against Creon. Uh, there's a sense that uh, she's her defiance is admirable, and therefore it, her defiance is admirable. And he's, his laws or his decrees were tyrannical, you know. And people now there's a sense that well, we're just obeying out of fear. You know, someone who's admirable would, would break with those things, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, she begins to, to spearhead, spearhead um, uh, a bit of a movement against him. I think that, that, that's quite clear. Uh, yeah, but, but getting back to the impressiveness of, of her and her convictions. Pardon me? Resolution. She's resolute. Yeah, she's resolute. Well, she's that's unselfish. Right. She's, she's She's holding, you know, up the highest principles as opposed to somebody who's doing things to further their own you know, situation. Or yeah, she's unselfish and uh, and she's willing to risk her life. And she makes that quite clear. I know that I will die. Of course I do. Even if you had not doomed me by the way proclamation. So she's also saying, you can't even hurt me, you know, because if you're going to kill me, I'm going to die anyways, you know. Uh, and this makes her all the more impressive, I think, because most people are cowards. You know, uh, and you know, uh, Ispane is, is the embodiment of most people. Most people want to keep their lives. Uh, they really don't believe in anything that they want to risk their lives for. Uh, most people are like the sentry. You know, and, uh, when he finds himself out, finally in this, this situation where his life's at risk, he's totally lost. If he stays alive, he's so thankful. You know, uh, and uh, he has he has no convictions whatsoever. Uh, doesn't know how to act. Uh, and uh, this kind of moral certainty she has, uh, the willingness to risk her life, to be resolute, all these things can affect the masses, very much so, and move them. Do you, do you, do you think of any, uh, any, any, any great examples of this? Any great examples? Great, great examples of this. Resolution? Christ comes to mind. Joan of Arc is a wonderful Joan of Arc. example. Yeah, Joan of Arc is a wonderful example. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the, this you know, it's heroic. You know, and the, the, the effects of a hero. Socrates is fun. I drink my hand. That's right. Socrates did it. Yep. Yeah. The strength of his beliefs. He died for truth. Galileo kind of not a good example. Kind of folding? Um, yeah, folding, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the impressiveness of, of such a person. I want to get back to the, the, the force of the admiration. Now, what, what does, I mean, because this, this is alien to us as well. I mean, not only have we destroyed tragedy, but we've destroyed, destroyed heroism as well. I mean, tragedy and heroism go together. I don't believe we have heroes anymore. Antigone is a hero. Oedipus is a hero. And, you know, and Sophocles is very interested in uh, celebrating the heroic, the effects of the heroic on society. Uh, uh, the admiration for the hero is something that uh, cities need, uh, I think. What, uh, what is the effect of the heroic? And why, do, why does Sophocles want to you know, encourage our admiration for the heroic? As opposed to the rational or the prudent, you know. For truth. For truth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How 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 would the heroic be an embodiment of of, of the of a love, admiration for truth, the love of truth? Yeah. Just Mm -hmm. 
fight for, fight for the truth, yeah, and uh, and for love as well. Love. Uh, what's wrong with fear as opposed to love? Like, why not celebrate just? I mean, as I said before, the, the beginning of the book is about these two things: love and fear. Spinet's fearful. Uh, Antigone is, is is full of love, and of course, this is part of her nobility. You know, she, she believes in this love, and, uh, <coughs> the connection to uh, her ancestors, and she's willing to die for these divine laws that protect the family, and protect the familial bonds. Uh, whereas this Manet, it's like, well, I fear for myself. You know, and I want to stay alive, and she's looking for all kinds of excuses to find to justify staying alive. Uh, why not build a society of fear like we do in the United States? Uh, let's have laws. Don't hurt me. I won't hurt you. Uh, Self-preservation is totally respectable. Uh, we don't have to look down on fearful people. They're sensible. You know, who doesn't want to stay alive? Uh, and sort of, we've taken, we've almost completely taken Ismene's perspective, the perspective of the fearful. We don't expect anyone to be heroic. We don't even expect you don't even have to go to war. Not even a draft. You know, only if you want to go, and we'll pay you, you know, to get involved. Uh, we don't expect you to do it if you want to. <laughs> you don't have to love anything or sacrifice yourself for anything. Just pay your taxes. You know, uh, that's hey, it. Hey, this is where I'm high taxes. Oh, there's a the, the sacrifice here? <laughs> is that heroic? No, okay, you don't want to... Not so much taxes, that's heroic. Yeah. You don't have to pay so much in taxes, that's heroic. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's heroic. Stand for something. That's right. Uh, anyone want to reflect on that? Uh, do, you, do you think we've lost anything by losing the heroic perspective? Because every time I ask people who are the heroes, they say things like, well, the firemen during 9 11, you know, which is a way of saying you don't have any heroes. You know, you don't know their names. You don't really know what they did. It's just you're just kind of repeating what everyone's saying. Yeah, they were did. They were heroic. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, the journals to keep getting killed off in Russia are a really interesting case these days. Yeah. Um, and Anton Shukri getting killed by the mafia and by Putin. Yeah, that's right. That's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, I don't think we have any here in the United States, though. Well, whistleblowers, you know, so who who. who Expose big conspiracies of, you know, smoking Kessler, letting at the end, you know, anti tobacco, the, uh, against the tobacco industry. The heroes in the name of Satan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the health, the health, health heroes. Health heroes. Health heroes. Yeah. Health heroes. Who are willing to stand up against big, strong interests. The ADM thing kind of didn't go that well, though. Like, I didn't know that being, you didn't get to become a hero in the end. Well, I don't know. Maybe it was an ADM thing. I would sort of challenge that we don't really have heroes today. Like I think the the idea of a community and understand knowing their names is perhaps you know pretty pretty different now, just the way we interact. But um, uh, you know, there's there's some uh, there's a guy named Admiral Stockdale. I don't know if, if any of you know him, but uh, oh, yeah, yeah, if you ever yeah. read about what he did in the Hanoi Hilton and keeping their spirits up and and making sure he couldn't be used himself for propaganda and, and the extensive measures he took, which warranted him, uh, or which got him like the Medal of Honor. Um, I think you can absolutely say that, and not to keep harping on the military thing, but like you know, when when people watch you know Band of Brothers or uh, you know Naruto and Iwo Jima, it's there's there's a, a factor there that's like no, it's, it's there was a dehumanization. There were terrible, terrible parts of that, and there really shouldn't be anything that we admire from a um, uh, from a materialistic point of view. But there is something there. There is that admiration for yeah, yeah we're going to take the hill or you know whatever and. Yeah, what, was, what was Stockdale's fate when he went public in America? Well, yeah, he really, like Ross Pro? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. It was Ross Pro's right? Yeah. What happened to him when he went with Ross Pro? He was mocked on Saturday Night Live. He was a laughing stock. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Just <laughs> To the vast majority, yeah. I, I, I agree. He yeah, has followers, obviously, but, but it's interesting to see what happened. You can know, name other heroes, too. Uh, McCain, you could say, was a yes. war hero. And you could uh, also uh, mention uh, Bob Hill, you know. What was the fates of these, these men? By <laughs> yeah. their, their, their heroism is never on it. You can't, you can't imagine, you can't imagine a, a poem being written about Stockdale or McCain. It was, was on for thousands of years. He says Christ, though. He's a hero, but he's mocked by many, right? Uh, yeah, you could say that. Uh, Maybe that is but, a, a common fate for all heroes, though. 
Uh, no, but I, that's not necessarily true. No, the, the Greeks honored their big heroes, you know, men like Achilles, you know, or uh, um, Oedipus, even, you know, obviously being honored in his tragedy. We just don't, 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 don't have a tragic sense. We don't, and we, we, we like to drag down our heroes. Do you a modern heroes. hero that hasn't been dragged down? Is that the idea? We like to drag them down because we don't like to admire anything greater than ourselves. <laughs> you know, we're, like, who's he to be a hero? I'm a hero, you know, and, uh, you know, and we're, we're very egalitarian. You know, and we don't like to look up to anything and think it deserves our, our honor or our allegiance. Greenspan was a hero for a long time. Greenspan? Like that banking, banking hero? Maybe, uh, I think we're, we're not talking about this. We're not understanding hero in the same oh, way. Oh, like Warren you Buffett? Know. No, they're just rich guys. You know, uh, <laughs> But the fact, the fact that these are heroes, should we have no heroes, you know? Uh, I think a lot of the heroes then go for political power, and then they get brought down because you know, there are a lot of forces in play, and people don't want them to gain power, and they have to mock them to do that. And so you can, you can be a hero if you're just a, you know, somebody who stood for a cause and is not looking for any further greatness. You might be admired for that. Mm -hmm. There's certainly something eroding about wanting to bring everyone down to the same level. I have a letter where it regresses the mean. He told me about the Danes and how they don't like to let people stand out. And if I know we didn't mind having heroes, we would probably need to question whether that you know, we are pushing things towards the means. Certainly, yeah. you know, no child left behind. Sometimes they get the scores up by not teaching the smart kids too well. <laughs> the letter mm -hmm. move towards the moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, we see here the first off of Asia, he's against that. You know, he wants to. Uh, Celebrate admiration. You know, he wants these these people who, who uh, uh, have courage and, and convictions uh, and are willing to risk their lives. Uh, and he's not willing to build a society of cowardice, basically, you know, uh, and, or, or fear, fear and equality. Uh, right? He's really uh, opposed to these two things. And he believes uh, that we need to admire, that we need to love. Uh, that, that was, there's something more human and divine about love than there is with fear. Fear individuates. Um, fear does not connect you to a higher order. It connects you to your own preservation of yourself. Really. Um, if there's any fear we should have, it should be fear of the gods, or breaking with the divine order, but not fear of us, just simply fear of other human beings. Uh, and Antigone is really an embodiment of that, so is her speech here. We need to withstand human man-made laws, to withstand man-made threats, to have something higher that man lives for, something higher that man loves, and to, and to sacrifice oneself. Because if you, if you live for yourself, uh, according to the Course of Speech, you live for nothing. Because, you know, man is this being that's going to come to be and pass away. Uh, and if you're just attached to yourself, you're, you're really not attached to anything eternal, because you're going to die. So we need to be part of this greater world. And fear is the passion that makes man forget that he needs to be part of this, this greater order. And man, man withdraws into himself uh, and into his own powers. Uh, he, begin, he begins to believe in the power of his arts, of his medicine. You know, and, and, uh, he forgets the eternal. Uh, and for Sophocles, man needs to be connected to eternity somehow. You cannot simply forget eternity and remain human. have to come to terms with what is with what is forever. Just to live a life of survival and preservation, you know, even if it means traveling across the seas and farming and, and practicing these arts and medicine. Ultimately all the arts and all these powers of men are, are forms of self-forgetting. When man as man takes too much pride in, the, in its capacities for ruling and governing himself and in conquering uh, chance and preserving himself uh, and not facing uh, the inevitability of death and, and, and the need to, for meaning to return. Uh, well, is it okay for you here? In, in a couple hours, Joe? According to the AC, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, and, uh, tomorrow, sorry, tomorrow. Uh, for the rest of the time, we're going to be in O'Hare, uh, room 106. George